Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Good morning. This morning we are reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 8, entitled Questions of King Parachit Maharaj. We're doing text 25 today. Atrapananam he bhavan Paramasti yatatma bhu Apare chanotishthanti Purvesam purvajaha kritam Atra in this matter, Pramanam, I dental, I dental facts, never dental facts. Sorry, I'm saying that as a why. He certainly, Bhavan yourself, Paramesti, Brahma. The creator of the universe. Yata as Atmabu, born directly from the Lord. Apare, others. Cha, only. Anotishtanti, just to follow. Purvesham, as a matter of custom. Purvajahe, knowledge suggested by the previous philosopher. Kritam, having been, uh, having been done. Translation. 
O great sage, you are as good as Brahma, the original living being. Others follow custom only, as followed by the previous philosophical speculators, philosophical speculators. Purple. It may be argued that Sukadeva Goswami is not the only authority of perfect knowledge in transcendence because there are many other sages and their followers. Contemporary to Vyasadeva, or even prior to him, there were many other great sages such as Gautama, Gananda, Jaimini, Kapila, Ashtavakra, and all of them have presented a philosophical path by themselves. Pantanjali is also one of them. And all these six great rishis have their own way of thinking, exactly like the modern philosophers and mental speculators. The difference between the six philosophical paths put forward by the renowned sages above mentioned and that of Sukadeva Goswami, as presented in the Srimad Bhavatam, is that all the six sages mentioned above speak the facts according to their own thinking. But Sukadeva Goswami presents the knowledge which comes down directly from Brahmaji, who is known as Atmabhu, or born of an edu- or, or born of and educated by the Almighty Personality of Godhead. Vedic transcendental knowledge descends directly from the Personality of Godhead by His mercy. Brahma, the first living being in the universe, was enlightened, and from Brahmaji, Narada was enlightened. And from Narada, Vyasa was enlightened. Sukadeva Goswami received such transcendental knowledge directly from his father, Vyasadeva. Thus, the knowledge being received from a chain of disciplic succession is perfect. One cannot be a spiritual master in perfection and until one has received the same by disciplic succession. That is the secret of receiving transcendental knowledge. The six great sages mentioned above may be great thinkers, but their knowledge by mental speculation is not perfect. However perfect the empiric philosopher may be in presenting a philosophical thesis, such knowledge is never perfect because it is produced by an imperfect mind. Such great sages also have their disciplic successions, but they are not authorised because such knowledge does not come directly from the independent supreme personality of Godhead Narayan. No one can be independent except Narayan. Therefore, no one's knowledge can be perfect, for everyone's knowledge is dependent on the flickering mind. Mind is material, and thus, knowledge presented by material speculators is never transcendental and can never become perfect. Mundane philosophers, being imperfect in themselves, disagree with other philosophers because a mundane philosopher is not a philosopher at all unless he presents his own theory. Intelligent persons like Maharaj Purikshit do not recognise such mental speculators, however great they may be, but hear from the authorities like Sukadeva Goswami, who is non-different from the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the Parampara system. That is, as is specifically stressed in the Bhagavad Gita. Translation again. O great sage, you are as good as Brahma, the original living being. Others follow custom only, as followed by the previous philosophical speculators. Good morning everyone. First of all, I'd like to offer my obeisances to Srila Prabhupada and ask for all the blessings from the senior devotees that I can say something of use. Before I start, one thing that just jumped to mind then is intelligent persons like Maharaj Purusha do not recognize such mental speculators however great they may be, but hear from the authorities like Sukadev Goswami. I'm reading a, uh, 
uh, book at the moment, uh, Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Vai Bhav about Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's life. And in the very beginning, it's talking about when Bhakti Siddhanta was a little boy and he, uh, a lot of Babaji's used to come and see Bhakti Vinod Thakur and visit him. And this one Babaji it mentions in the book, he went up to Bhakti Vinod Thakur and he says, why doesn't your son offer obeisance, obeisances to me? And he said to the uh, Babaji, oh, my son doesn't offer obeisances to uh, Sahajas. See? <laughs> that made me think of that story. He's such intelligence at such a young age and he knew exactly who to inquire from. Quite amazing. I think he was only like 10 years old. So another thing what jumps out uh, in this verse, uh, they're talking about the civic succession and the potency of the civic succession and how important it is for knowledge to come down through a civic succession. Uh, descending knowledge, not ascending knowledge. Uh, and that, that is because we have uh, our, our, own, our own conception and ideas are very distorted. And uh, it's because this body, when we're born into this material world, it comes with a lot of impediments. <clears throat> It's uh, when you first take birth, you don't know that there's certain terms and conditions. It's, you know, with Apple computers these days, they're always redoing their terms and conditions and you've got to tick a box and there's pages and pages of information what you're signing up for. So in this body, we also get certain terms and conditions along with the body. And with this body, we get the, uh, we get the four defects of conditional life which is we have the propensity to cheat, we make mistakes, we've got imperfect senses, and we're under illusion. And uh, these four things right here make it very difficult for one to come to the absolute truth by themselves from an absolute standpoint. And that is because, you know, we've got a wild mind, we're completely bewildered by the illusionary energy, um, you know, we've got the propensity to cheat, and we're continuously making mistakes so that's why it's so important to get this knowledge passed down through a pure disciplic succession. And we've seen so many paths in the past. First of all, we've been so fortunate within Krishna consciousness to have such a pure transcendental line of disciplic succession, keeping this knowledge nice and pure. Uh, but we can see how things can change when uh, you don't have such acharyas and transcendental personalities passing down this knowledge. I remember at school we would actually do little tests like this. We would start with a, a, a little bit of knowledge and you'd have 30 people in, in a line and you would say something like, instance, this tree outside the room is green. And as it went down through all these kind of uh, different uh, students within the class, the knowledge would just continuously change through each person. But by the time it got to the last person, the original statement and original idea was completely contaminated and completely different. And we're seeing that in today's world. We uh, had some uh, good examples within um, other paths. We've got someone like uh, Jesus Christ of the Nazareth who was walking this planet many, many years ago, 2,500 years ago or something like this. Yeah, around that. And he was a Sakiva Shavata, so he was empowered to preach about the Lord. And he lived a, a, very, uh, a very pure life. Uh, people will say these days, you know, if he was on this planet today, he would be a Hare Krishna. So he lived a very pure life, but you see how his teachings over the years have been con contaminated or the way he lived his life have been contaminated. For instance, he was uh, very big on they shall not kill uh, Jesus, but you see a lot of the followers of Jesus today, they take that as we just won't kill humans. Humans have a soul, so we won't kill them. But everyone else, that's just, that's just free range. We can hurt the animals, we can kill the animals. 
and we can lord it over other species and we can enjoy them for our own senses. But if you really look at the life of Jesus, uh, yeah, that's not the way he would have lived his life and uh, we can see here that his teachings have been distorted. Uh, There's a verse in the uh, Bhagavad Gita what reminds me of such uh, great personalities when Krishna is talking about uh, the qualities of great devotees of the Lord. Avesta Sava Bhutanam Matre Kuruna Eva Cha. And it's the first line of a verse in the Bhagavad Gita. And it's saying that uh, one who is non envious and is a kind friend to all living beings, this devotee is very dear to me. So that's definitely the qualities that Jesus would have had many years ago. Uh, the qualities that he exhibited and just over time his uh, teachings have just been contaminated and people have made up their own ideas how things should be and uh, we see a, another example of uh, uh, speculators and uh, people just making up their own uh, ideas in this world we, we go back you know, we can go back even 100 years from this point where we're at right now. And we really have to look and think, okay, we've got all these people who uh, have these beautiful minds, they're creating all these kind of things um, just from their own standpoint. But really have what they created really done us any favours? Have we really come that far um, in that department on this planet in the last 100 years? Some would say yes, but from my viewing and from a lot of other people's viewings, it's kind of gone backwards. We've lost the essence of who we really are. So, and another thing in today's society, we get a lot of uh, startup movements, which I was involved in when I was younger. So nothing coming down this disability succession or nothing to send in. It was all just to send in knowledge so a lot of people just start in their own movements, their own ideas. And I remember when I was young, uh, I was really eager to uh, find some kind of a spiritual path. Ever since I was a little boy, I was uh, interested in spiritual topics and spiritual, per- uh, spiritual personalities especially. So when I was younger, I kind of took the... Uh, uh, I was really interested in uh, St. Francis of Assisi. So growing up, I kind of like idolized St. Francis. But as I got a little bit older, I didn't really know uh, what to do or where to go for knowledge. I hadn't re- met the right people yet to give me the, the, the right advice where to seek knowledge from. I didn't have the intelligence uh, like Maharaj Parikshit to, to actually understand what real knowledge was and who to ask knowledge from. And I came across some really interesting personalities and and knowledge. There was times there when I was going to... um, On the side, I was spending time with Buddhist monks. At one stage, I was thinking of maybe becoming a Buddhist monk, but that wasn't really for me. But on the side of doing all of this, I was even going to uh, seminars uh, with people who channel... So we had these rooms filled with uh, like 5,000 people in Sydney and a lady or a man would just get up on stage and they would just be like, today I'm going to channel such and such, this is a personality from such and such and they're going to teach us about this and that. But if you really look deep into something like that, you know, that person's got no authority, we don't really know if they're telling the truth, if they're really channeling channeling someone, if they are channeling someone, where is that personality from? So there's so many things what you have to question. But in today's society where so many people are lost and confused, this is what's going on. People are looking down all kinds of roads and avenues for knowledge and they're getting it from some very unusual places. So I was doing this for a while and I thought I was getting some knowledge and um, uh, some information to help me move forward in my spiritual path. But one of the things I found out when you kind of just get in this like 
I call it like spaghetti knowledge because it's just wobbly, it just falls everywhere, it's got no ground in, it just slides through, pe through people's fingers. Um, so when I was getting this kind of knowledge, it makes you uh, feel good at the time. You might think, oh, this sounds good, or that sounds good, this is going to improve my life, but you don't get anything of uh, any permanent uh, solid value. So I continued and uh, I started dabbling once again in uh, kinds, different kinds of Buddhism, uh, Vipassana meditations. Uh, and still for me, they didn't really have any solid uh, grounding. They were very shaky. Uh, a lot of people that I met who were following these certain paths, their lives didn't really match up with the paths that they were teaching and preaching about. Uh, so that was very difficult for me and it wasn't until uh, a very uh, nice, beautiful, sunny day in Byron Bay where uh, I suppose I just got the Lord's mercy and after looking for so long and just continuously stum stumbling across these kind of very uh, shaky bits of knowledge that people were giving me, um, which they were calling the absolute truth or this is the way we should live and so forth. I finally came into contact with uh, a devotee of the name of Charanaravinda in, in Byron Bay. And uh, yeah, so after many, many years, I was finally got revealed to me this path of Krishna Bhakti, this path of Bhakti Yoga. And one of the main things I remember uh, when I first came into Krishna consciousness and started reading Prabhupada's books, one of the most impressive things for me was that this knowledge that I was reading uh, was actually spoken by Krishna, the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of God, spoken by Krishna on the battlefield of Kurusetra to his disciple Arjuna. Uh, I just found that really amazing that these were the words actually spoken by the Lord. And uh, what even impressed me more that there was this amazing uh, disciplic succession, this parampara system of all these amazing personalities who have walked this planet, who kept this knowledge pure. And not only did they keep the knowledge pure, but they actually, uh, they walked the talk themselves. I, I, I was always very interested in uh, all these amazing personalities we have on the wall here. When I first came into Krishna consciousness, I was eager, like, who was before Prabhupada? Who was Prabhupada's spiritual master, spiritual master? And as I dived deeper into all of this, I could see that uh, these just weren't any ordinary people. These were just some extraordinary uh, personalities. And I knew I was under something special then. So after many, many years of searching and looking and finding just this wobbly, um, unsatisfying knowledge, I finally got my hands on the ultimate truth, this Krishna Bhakti, Bhakti Yoga, which has been passed down in this Paranpara system um, and kept pure. So I felt very fortunate. So yeah, this is something I really learned coming into Krishna consciousness that this, when we're trying to attain knowledge, how important it is for this knowledge to be descending down to a line of disciplic succession. As I look back over my life, I could see that all the knowledge that I was getting was ascending, so coming from the ground up. A lot of people starting their own movements, their own ideas on religion. Um, like I said just before, people channeling people. So it's just all very warped and phasey and confusing. So what happens when you stumble across such a path like this, which is so pure and a chain which is unbroken. For myself, I found in the material world uh, there's so many distractions and there's so many obstacles. 
So although I was following certain paths which were, um, people were saying were spiritual or were this and were that, I was actually trying really hard. I was really putting in the effort. Uh, but because the knowledge wasn't absolute, it was very hard for me to overcome certain things within this material world. You know, our senses are running wild, and that was very hard for me to control before I came into such a path. I'm, I'm reading, um, I was reading an article by Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj the other day, which he read in, in 19, August 1927. And he, he quotes, he quotes uh, Jesus, and even Jesus was saying many years ago, that the mind is like an undrained horse, just running here, there, and everywhere. So as I was engaging in these other uh, philosophies and ideas of living, I found to myself that I wasn't really getting what I needed to get. It was all very surface level. Uh, and it is surface level because it's just this ascending knowledge, it's just created and it may give you a little taste of something for a short time, but it's not a long time, that's for sure. But this Krishna consciousness coming into something which is so pure, um, our eternal dharma, the dharma of the soul, to serve Krishna. Not only do you feel good as you come into Krishna consciousness, but it builds and builds and builds um, each day. So not only are you feeling good, and not only are you making you know, small advancement each day, but little bit by little bit, you attain certain attributes which help you navigate here within the material world. And that's what I wanted so bad as I was growing up, to try to find certain ways and certain meditations for me to navigate this material world. But all the practices that I was trying, um, they only had that short, uh, that short period kind of uh, a substance for myself. But know this Krishna consciousness which has come down in this pure line, uh, I got so much from, and from getting so much from it, I got the attributes to help me navigate here within the material world. So I'm very fortunate that I've come into contact with this, this, this line. I'm very uh, grateful for Srila Prabhupada. So many things I've learned. I remember trying, uh, I was trying uh, Buddhism meditation for many, many years. And I was going away and spending time with Buddhist monks for sometimes months at a time. And I was meditating, so I was so, I was so hungry for truth or to discover something more in this life that I would sit in one spot sometimes for 10 to 14 hours in silence and doing this certain Buddhism meditation. And that's a lot of time, 10 to 14 hours each day, not moving. And uh, I was doing this for months and months and then I'd go home and I'd practice that same practice at home. But I, I still found, although I was getting these short glimpses of peacefulness and so forth, it wasn't really carrying over into my life. And that's not until I came into Krishna consciousness and was fortunate enough to come into contact with the devotees, which then revealed the, the holy name to me. I remember saying to the devotees when I first come, um, you know, a couple of weeks from chanting this holy name was, a, was I got the same benefit as I did chanting years and hours of other kind of meditations. And why is that? It's because this holy name of Krishna uh, comes directly from the spiritual world. Uh, uh, I was reading another article by Bhakti Siddhanta, and Prabhupada also talked about this. Uh, <clears throat> in the material world, we can just say, table, 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 and that's not the same as the actual, actual table. But in the spiritual world, the name and the form are no different. I remember hearing that, and that made me really excited. So we're so fortunate that we get to chant this name, which is no different from Krishna, and so purifying. 
So after many, many years trying all these different other uh, philosophies and uh, different styles of meditation, which really didn't give me any substance, I finally got something which gave me substance. And something which, uh, which, something which really purifies the heart. And that's something which I was really looking for when I was growing up. So once again, yeah, after many, many, many years, trying, looking, searching here, there and everywhere, I was so fortunate to come into contact with this uh, bhakti yoga process. Um, something which is forever growing, as all you devotees will know. Uh, some devotees here have been around for like 40, 50 years and they would say to you, each day is vibrant in Krishna consciousness, each day is new, um, it gets better and better and this is what spiritual life should really be about, a process which is actually purifying the hearts, it's becoming more and more ecstatic, one's relationship is deepening with themselves, one's relationship is deepening with uh, the Lord, uh, yeah, it doesn't really get any better than that. So yeah, I feel very fortunate. Um, I'm very grateful to Srila Prabhupada, uh, to my spiritual master, um, and to all the devotees here at New Govardhan and all around the world that uh, I was able to link into this Parampara system, into this uh, chain of um, absolute extraordinary personalities and um, actually get revealed to me the, the real essence, the real knowledge of life and something you can um, just grab with both hands and run with. Uh, so, yeah, I think I'll finish there today. I just really wanted today to just really focus on that disciplic succession and the potency it can have and uh, how in today's world, in today's age, there's so many different things popping up and it's very hard for people to really understand uh, what truth is or what a real path is. And uh, that's why it's so important for people like, and devotees like Charanaravinda who go out on the streets and Rupa Raghunath who works tirelessly out on the streets to give people this knowledge. Because without these uh, amazing devotees out on the street, I might have still been going to the you know, Sydney and listen to some person bring in some living entity from some other universe and tell me some knowledge which isn't true. So this Krishna consciousness, it's like what Prabhupada said, it's the perfection of life. Um, it can really give all living entities what they're looking for. It's just that a lot of the living entities don't really know what they're looking for or they're looking down the wrong avenues. So yeah, it's up to us devotees to share this knowledge and um, and link them in to this disciplic succession. I remember when I first took uh, shelter of B. Krishna Maharaj, uh, I, was, I came into Krishna consciousness and it was kind of a rough period for me. But I remember just when I took shelter of such a devotee, just shelter, I hadn't taken initiation yet, but in my heart I accepted him as my spiritual master. And it seriously felt like I was in the ocean and there was a boat coming past and I got thrown like a, a, a chain or a rope which I connected to myself and I felt linked in. And this is another uh, uh, form of potency of this, the silly succession of his parampara. Just by linking yourself into this, it completely changes one's life. Uh, and you get so much mercy being linked into this, the silly succession. So, Hare Krishna. If there's any questions? Yeah. Yeah. I, st I, I when I first came into Krishna consciousness, people would ask me about all the certain practices that I did, and. Uh, I, was, I, I can be a pretty fanatical personality at times, so I, I really stuck certain practices out. But, yeah, I think, um, and this can go, I think I speak for a lot of people here, but anything in life, and especially in spiritual life, 
although the paths, certain paths can be bewildering or lead you down kind of the wrong avenue or um, may give you the wrong piece of information, I kind of used everything as a stepping stone. So if I look back now, I kind of took what I could from certain practices and also I, I gained certain qualities, I think, from doing certain things. But I just look back at it now, I just I use certain uh, practices and so forth as stepping stones and those stepping stones led me towards Krishna consciousness. Uh, I look back now to you know, my earlier years, I, d I don't think I could have just come here and taken up Krishna consciousness, I don't think that I was ready for it. Uh, but uh, after doing certain things and uh, swiping certain ideas out of the way and you know, certain things that I did that helped me understand what I really wanted and what I was looking for, so when that moment came in my life, when I, when I first got my hands on Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, as it is, I was completely ready for it. I knew exactly what I was looking for. I knew what my heart wanted and I knew what I wanted to get out of spiritual life and the kind of relationship that I wanted with God out of all these kind of failures, what I had in my life trying to look for the Lord. So as soon as I got my hands on that Bhagavad Gita, I read it in two weeks. I just sat there and read it. Um, yeah, I just knew that that was uh, perfect, exactly what I was looking for, and yeah, that came at the right time. That's it. You still able to read back up here in two weeks? <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, that moment I read Bhagavad Gita, and it's a funny thing, I, I was uh, doing some kind of meditation with this big group of people and I just said, look, I've just got this urge to go to Byron Bay, just by myself. And I went there for two weeks, this was in 2015, and I went to Byron Bay and on the second day I was going to get a juice and I walked around the corner and Charanaravinda was there with the Bhagavad Gita. And I spent my whole time in Byron Bay just reading the Bhagavad Gita. And Charanaravinda was a very, uh, very kind friend. He gave me his number when he first met me. And I messaged him just after I finished reading and said, look, I'm pretty much convinced. I need to come and see you where you live. And I came here for a Sunday feast. And shortly after that, I moved here. Never looked back. And yeah, it just gets better and better, you know, it just starts with the Bhagavad Gita and that's just an extraordinary book and Prabhupada and so many other books which I've been so fortunate to read and um, you can read them over and over again and you learn more, more and more. Uh, the knowledge in there is limitless, it doesn't stop, uh, there's always something we can learn from these books. They're not books which you just read once and throw it down and say game over. Uh, you can read it again, you learn more, read it again, you get something more, you learn more about yourself. Uh, yeah, very fortunate. Thanks to uh, Charanaravinda. And also all the devotees here when I first come here. Um, yeah, I really felt like I was at home. And yeah, it's a great life. Yes, Vaishnavi, at the back. Charanavinda's wife, who I've just been talking about. Yeah, I think, uh, well I know, in um, New Zealand, with uh, some of the preaching centres they've got going on there, I think they really lead the way in different styles of preaching and making Krishna consciousness really attractive to like the younger crowd. Um, and I know many devotees who have gone through the process in New Zealand, uh, or have been and stayed in certain ashrams in New Zealand, um, yeah, they've got this, uh, you could say it's a, maybe a bit more uh, 
open to, to the people. They do certain events. Like I know I was watching a, a preaching program last night in New Zealand. I was just watching a program last night actually on YouTube. And they had like a younger crowd and they were like doing rap songs about Krishna. And so they weren't, uh, they still had the purity there, but the way they preached, they just made it a bit more uh, uh, attractive to the real young crowd, you know, people who are just in school or finishing school. So as devotees, we can do that here at New Govardhan or when we go out and do preaching programs. You know, we can go to parks, we can play games with people, Krishna conscious games, we can. Uh, make fun songs about Krishna, do certain activities and just little things like this. So the sky's really the limit, just as long as we keep that purity there. Um, you know, we follow four yearly principles, we chant uh, our rounds each day, um, the way we treat other Vaishnavas, all that's still there. But yeah, we can just make it uh, fun. And yeah, so in New Zealand, I find they, they, they do that nicely over there. And, um, you know, we're also very fortunate here in New Gavadam, we've got the the, the Krishna village down there so uh, there's uh, lots of programs going on down there and they get the uh, kirtans on Tuesday nights and but yeah I think that's a really good point you brought up we should always be thinking uh, Prabhupada would always be like that thinking of other ways uh, we can uh, approach people or certain things we can do to bring more people into Krishna consciousness we should never stop thinking that we shouldn't just be like Okay, we're just going to give Bhagavad time class. We're just going to go and do books. But we should always be thinking, what's another way we can preach? What's another way we can bring more people into Krishna consciousness? Um, like I, I do a lot of service with KK now, and he works with the bulls, and he gets so many people from the village. They come to see the bulls. But when you come to see the bulls with KK, you also get this um, amazing stories about Krishna and about Krishna's cows and just by just going down to the bulls these people get uh, a big taste for Krishna just uh, by hearing in this amazing kind of scenery you know down there with the the trees and the paddocks and the bulls around so it just changes it up a bit and uh, yeah, people really like that so yeah thank you that's it All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to the Srimad Bhagavatam. Yigavadam ki jai.